itself, okay, and also the lollipops forming the white thing here. Um, so they tell you this is the cross section. This is what the structure looks like, the loading of the structure. Okay, the thing is 12 feet long. It's a uniformly distributed load of 120 pounds per foot. Okay, and then want to know what is the bending stress. This. Well, the thing that's interesting about this is that if you look at the formula, there are two components to this. One is the cross-sectional properties. The cross-sectional properties, specifically the moment of inertia and how far the distance is from here to the top or from here to the bottom, that is a measure of the structure's ability to withstand loading. So what you have here is this tells you how well it can stand up to a load. This tells you how bad the load is. So those two components, the loading and the, the cross-sectional properties, will determine what the stress is. The other thing that's interesting about this, did we ever say what the stuff is made out of? You know, it could be wood, it could be brass, it could be aluminum, it could be frozen guacamole, it could be whatever you want to do. Uh, it doesn't matter, the stress would be the same. Okay, the difference is the material's ability to withstand that, that stress is different. So you can do all these calculations here and decide later, do I want to make this out of brass, aluminum, or steel? Then the calculations are still good. The only thing that changes is the material's ability to withstand that stress. So I'm making sense here, I hope. So whenever you have a problem like this, there's two things you're going to have to look at. What is the moment of inertia? Okay, because that will tell you how much, how well that cross section can withstand a bending load, an internal bending load. So that will tell you how much, it, you know, how well it can stand a bending load. This tells you what the internal bending load is. Bending load, the internal moment. So let's do a, a few things here. Uh, when you look at this piece, one thing that's nice about it is that the part is doubly symmetric. It is symmetric about the x-axis and about the y-axis. And I'll write here that this is down my y-axis and this is, here's my y, here's my x. So if a part is doubly symmetric, is it easy to figure out where the centroid is? It's right in the geometric center. You go half of x, half of y, and you got it. So I put this thing here. I'm saying the location of the composite centroid is easy, or this is where it is, because the part is doubly symmetric. If it's symmetrical about this axis and symmetrical about that axis, then the point where they're symmetrical about both gives you that point right there. Right the same. same thing if you pick any of any uh, white flange beam, any I beam, it's the same thing. It's symmetric, top to bottom, left to right. So the both the uh, centroid is always in the geometric center. So what I'm going to have to do with this is just figure out the moment of inertia. Okay, We only need I sub x because the force is acting down. Now what we know on this is, this is all they gave us. I came up with these dimensions on my own. The centroid of this is an inch up. And if this is midway, half of this is 2 plus 1 is 3. That's where its individual centroid is. The individual centroid of part two is coincides directly with uh, the composite. It's right on the composite here. This one, of course, is three down the other one. And once we know what this is, I can say then that the distance from my bending equation from here to the top or from here to the bottom, C to the top is four, C to the bottom is four. Okay, which is what you will see with a symmetric piece. Only with an asymmetric piece will it be different. So this is a pretty simple shape to deal with, uh, which is part of the reason why I picked it. I didn't want to spend the whole time just crunching numbers. Just wanted to go over the concept with it. Let's go over how we figure. How do we get what the true moment of inertia is about the composite here? Well, how we wind up doing that is we're going to have to take the moment of inertia of the three parts and then 
uh, apply the parallel axis theorem and then add up the total. Okay, pretty much what we have done in the past. We will have to note what the uh, area is for the parallel axis theorem. If you look at one, what we have here, this has been two times four, and that equals eight. Everyone see that? Okay, three, I'm just going to write eight because three and one are the same piece. That's right. Okay, two, the area on that is four by one. One by four, however you like it. Okay, there's my areas. What you, is... Do you draw that, that area for, for the center piece? Is, is it specified in there? I mean, it looks like it's one, I'm just saying this is No, the area right? of it, of two. Oh, yes, I see it now. It's four. four. One by four. One, one by four. four. I won't get okay. For a rectangle, what's the formula for a moment of inertia? Base. VH cubed over 12, right? This one here is VH cubed over 12. What's the base on this one? This base. No, two is the height. Four. 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 Four is the base in this case. Four. Four. By two. Times two cubed. Cube. Over 12. This comes to 2.667. Remember that if you're looking at the x-axis, the height is always perpendicular to the axis. Okay, everyone agree so far? Let's look at this one here. Let's look at the middle piece, the h cubed over 12. That's still a good formula, isn't it? What's the base on this one? That uh, is one. One. The height? Four. Four cubed. If we do that, that comes out to be 5.33. Okay, now. For this top piece, I figured out the moment of inertia here is 2.667. I don't want it here, I want it here. So I have a dy1 of 3. Everyone see that? Here's the individual centroid where I took the moment of inertia. Here's where I need it. I need it about the composite center. I have to do dy is 3. This one here is also 3. This one Okay, let me put its individual central is right there. So what is dy for the second part? Zero. Zero. Okay, now if I apply the parallel axis theorem with dy equals to zero, this comes to 5.333. If I apply the parallel axis theorem here, and let me write down what, what it would wind up being, 2.667 plus 8 times 3 squared. When I do that over here, this comes to be 74.667. 74.667. Add up the three of them, it comes to 154.66. Uh, Question. Yes. So the reason why the dy for two is zero is because the its centroid is in, in its, its center itself. So yeah, you're, it, you're not measuring. Up. It's concentric with. It's right on the point where the uh, composite centroid is. Okay. It's easy to make a mistake to say, okay, it's from the base up to that height, you know, but it's, it's not in relation to anything. Everything is yeah. in relation. To well, one of the things is there's a confusion when you say mc over i. C in that equation is not the, not the centroid. It is the distance from the composite centroid to either the top or the bottom. Notice we figured out the centroid was here, but the distance from here to the very top is four. From here to the very bottom is four. The whole piece is eight inches and the thing is right in the middle. And would that be given in the problem or we have to find it out. Oh, in that case, it's not difficult, I think. Yeah, no, you, you have to have the cross-section of the piece. 
And if he had the more section, he could put it around the central. Yeah, it's a nice copy. Yeah, then, you know, if they give you a different piece, as long as they give you what the cross section looks like, you can calculate where the central is. So this is something here that helps me with the, uh, knowing the structure's ability to handle uh, bending stress. Okay, well, I'm able to take a couple of simplifying steps here. Okay, notice I'm trying to color code this, the stuff that I'm adding to the basic information I'm kind of showing you in. I have 120 pounds per foot. This thing goes on for 12 feet. What's the total <coughs> weight of a beam? 140. Okay. Yeah, very good. Do it in your head. Now, with this being the case, if I have a symmetrical load and a symmetrical structure, each support su supports half the weight. So I can say here that R1 is equal to R2 is equal then to this over this, and that is 720 pounds. So I'm going to make this 720, and this one here 720. Lots of times it, it isn't symmetric. You're going to have to actually do the calculation, but this time it is. Okay? Now, my graph here, I know this starts at zero, ends at zero. Go up 720, go up to here. Here's my 720. I know then that after six feet, okay, if I am losing, 120 pounds per foot, after six feet, I'm at zero. Everyone see that? I continue down at the same rate for another six feet. This is then here minus 720. 720 plus this pushes it back up to zero. Voila! Okay. Let's uh, keep this here. It's an honor to do this. So I'm going to take my head a little bit what I calculated. That's okay, from here knowledge. we are going to get the values of our moment diagram. A1 is then equal then to 1 half 6 times 720, and that's equal to 2160, right? Yeah, that's right. Three times this is zero six twenty one. A two is below the axis, same area, minus this. Comes to zero. Fancy that. Perfect parabola. Yes, sir. Correct. Probably won't. Imperfectly drawn, though. Correct. I'll be agree with that. Now I'm even more agree. <laughs> Close enough? <laughs> okay, so here's my M max. And this, of course, is foot back. Everyone agree? Everyone see where it comes from? Yes. Yeah, so the rule of thumb uh, that we find that you did for R1 and R2. If you have any other forces going into that graph, you cannot use that because it, it wouldn't apply. Yes, for that to work, the load has to be symmetrically applied and the structure has to be symmetric. And of course, if you looked at it, the vast majority of problems we have done, that's not the case. No. Okay? Yeah, but I picked this, you know, so that we spent less time crunching numbers. I wanted to get to the uh, to the theory behind it, the actual application. So if this is true here, oh, you can go ahead. My bad. I well, want I want to finish. Yeah, well, I figured you'd send the pictures to the FBI, in which case it'll be. 
Okay. okay, so if we have, this here is foot pounds. If I multiply it times 12, I wind up with 25,920 inch pounds. Everyone agree with that? Max. Yes. Oh, you don't know? Huh? You don't? No. No, no, yes. No, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The formula for bending stress, MC over Y. <laughs> this is the biggest number we get from that graph in inch pounds. 25,920. See, if you look at our original diagram, it doesn't matter if we go up or go down, the end C is 4. Divide this by our moment of inertia about the x-axis, 154.667, and this comes to 670.3 PSI. There's your bending stress. <laughs>